We are stoked. But I'm a terrible, I'm oh, a terrible oh, sore loser. Oh, I don't follow the rules. All the bearded guys need to lie. Yeah. There are rumors galore. I am so up and down on my emotions right now. Retain salary. Okay. Where there is smoke, there is always fire. Etc. 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 You don't do it. Been there, done that, and we'll get into it later. They know crap about hockey. Come on. Well, I laugh it off. I have no issue. Here's the thing, though. I have nothing. To do. I'm okay with this deal. There was no other option. So now you have nothing. We already blew it. Win now. Win now. It paid off. I, 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 I will eat my pants. Hey guys, it's Two Guys in Hockey Talk. I'm Pavel, the cat, and... I'm Revan Ev, Evan Rennertz, back for a juicy story time today with our guests. But before we go there, let's grab your bevy and have a drink, dude. <laughs> yeah, enjoy. Or whatever you guys got out there. Well, Whatever why don't we start enjoy, off? Make sure you have it. You listen up. We love having you in. So remember to like, share, and subscribe. We love all the followers. We love all the comments. We love all the feedback you guys have been sending us and all the ideas. We love it. Keep doing it. The season's been going on. It's been crazy. There's been a lot of stories happening. Uh, we're going to get into some crazy Islander stuff. But before we do, we just wanted to announce that Evander Kane was suspended for 21 games for uh, the fake vaccine card. Um, and so it's one of the longer suspensions that was implemented. We know it was a fake vaccine card. Is that actually factual or do we just know breaking COVID protocol? Well, breaking COVID protocol, but, but the rumor is, is yeah. that, that that's what people were letting us yeah. know. So, I mean, you know, it, they, they made the decision. He apologized. He made a statements, not only to uh, the NHL, but to yeah. his teammates and the Sharks organizations and his fans. Um, I mean, He's going to lose some money over that. I know he's still getting counseling. I know they're still working through some other stuff. And I know the allegations that were put forward by his ex-wife, uh, there was no uh, substantiated evidence right. found yeah. for grounds for any further disciplinary action. So, you know, we wish him all the best. We hope we can get back to the game. Um, we definitely will see how this story unfolds. But it definitely, definitely, the NHL is cracking down. And, of course, as you guys all know, there's a lot of players still going through COVID protocols. Um, just last night, Nathan McKinnon was back after being on COVID protocol for a bit. Now, we want to preface that being on pro COVID protocol does not mean you have COVID. It's just you may be around someone who had COVID. So you're just being protected, you know. And so we're watching that steps. But, Evan, what's been going on? Well, world. hey, I just want to bring up, I, I've been letting you guys kind of know on the prospect side of it, it uh, over in Russia in the KHL. So uh, Matvey Michkov, who's supposed to be running against Conor Bedard as kind of the top number one player. We all believe Conor Bedard will be not for this year, next year. Yeah. We're talking two years away from this guy getting drafted, but he's been turning heads. So Mishkov, he in his first two games, he had three points, but I got to let you guys know, 10 games in, He's still sitting at three points, and it looks like he's averaging about 12 minutes a game on that fourth line. So this will be interesting, Pavel. Is this actually a path? Should Will he lose confidence as a scorer, or will he actually be gaining new skills while he's not scoring, playing with men when you're a 16-year-old boy? Yeah, it's tough to say. I, I think that putting up goals builds a lot of confidence for any player. It takes that monkey off your shoulder or your back yeah. and you really feel like you can really play the game. That being said, there are so many elements to a game and we're going to get into this with our two guests about what it takes to play as a team, what it play takes to compete and doing all the little things and what certain coaches like Barry Trotz does of the Islanders expect of their players to do. And what you mean when you need to grind, when you need yeah. to battle, be defensively sound. So I think it'll be good. I think it's too short of a sample to, to determine that he's going to yeah. lose his confidence. Certainly the young man has a lot on his shoulders, but there's a lot of expectations for him. But I believe he's going to be a, an all-star once he gets into the NHL in a few years' time. So uh, I throw this one more thing in there. So I just pulled Bedard's... Uh 
numbers up, guys. Remember, he plays with young men. Um, so he's playing with most of them are going to be 17 to 20 year olds uh, is who he's playing with with the Regina Pats. Not an incredible team. They're good. But in seven games, Bedard last year in, in and he had what was it? Seven games and 14 points or he was like two point a game as a 15 year old. So this year, seven games, five points, five points. So. I think everyone, if you've been looking at him as the next generational talent, he's good. But usually you don't go in that kind of slump if you've looked at the players like Eric Lindros, Mara Lemieux, Wayne Gretzky, Sidney Crosby, Connor McDavid, even John Tavares, um, if you're looking at those kind of numbers. So that's interesting. I don't know, and I almost wonder, Pavel, if he's nagging a bit of an injury. But I'm just letting you guys know because not everyone follows the young prospects. So give you a little bit of information before we hit the NHL New York Islanders talk. So... Before we go to our guests here, why don't you give us a little story here on someone? Oh, Chris Simon. So, yeah. So, I guess Chris Simon has been known in history's time for having quite a few suspensions. So, knowing the longest longevity of some of the suspensions out there, Chris Simon has his fair share. Um, you know, I think he's gotten up to 20, if I recall, in uh, 2007, if I recall. No, wow. Wow. It's a while back. You're going to have to look that up. You guys have to correct me. But, you know, there, there's definitely been some players who have gotten some uh, suspensions that are uh, long term. You know, Rafi Torres comes to mind, you know, and we don't see it that often, those long based uh, suspensions, because oftentimes it's no more than four to seven games. You know, you have your N- Nazem Kadri who's gotten a few. Tom Wilson has had a few. You know, the goons. Brad Marchand, I think, has had a few but they never go to that length of time. So it'll be interesting to see. And uh, so, you know. so, so Chris Simon, 30 game suspension is the longest in NHL history. Okay. So he's the longest. Yeah. <laughs> so do, do the Islanders need more Chris Simon or they do, they need a little bit more Matt Barzell. <laughs> Well, we're about to find out. So, Evan, why don't you introduce us to our new guests? Hey, well, today our guest, excited to have TJ and the grumpy old man from the Islanders Never Say Die podcast. Excited to have you guys here. Welcome today, guys. Thanks for having us. Uh, it's going to be fun. You get exposed to the, uh, the grumpy old man. <laughs> As you can tell, that's me. Because if you listen to TJ, I mean, who would listen to him, honestly? Uh, people tune in to listen to the grumpy old man. TJ is just my comic foil. He's my straight man, so to speak. I'm the guy who keeps you under wraps. I'm the one who keeps you from going insane. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's it, grumpy old man. Yeah, we cover in Islanders, the Islanders, the New York Islanders, that is. Um, and you can find us there at the uh, Islanders Never Say Die podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Also, we have a side podcast called TJ and the Grumpy Old Man, where we talk sports, we talk sports and shoot the shit. That's a good little podcast. We do our Islanders podcast every single Wednesday and Saturday at 9 or at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we do TJ and the Grumpy Old Man every Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and every Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So we keep plenty of busy talking a lot of hockey, talking a lot of sports. Okay. (laughs) Let me just translate that for people who are listening. We do the Islanders Never Say Die podcast on Saturdays and Wednesdays, 8 o'clock-ish. Why do I say 8 o'clock-ish? Because it's 8 o'clock TJ time, so it's not actually 8 o'clock. That's why you have to subscribe. This way you know that, oh, okay, when are they supposed to be? It's 8 o'clock. Are they on? No. Hold on. Just put on the notification. 8.20, 8.30, 8.45. Oh, here we go. And then we have the TJ and the Grumpy Old Man. Same basic concept. 8 o'clock-ish on Thursdays and 9, uh, 9 o'clock ish on thursdays excuse me and eight o'clock ish on sundays That's cool. That's cool. seems, seems like you guys got a flexible schedule and I, I see a lot of similarities between evan and i in terms of him being a very nice guy and i'm trying to be a grumpy but i'm young so man grumpy. <laughs> but uh, thank you for being on the show we appreciate it it's uh it's a good thing i got a drink on this because it definitely needs this we've had some good conversation off the screen i hope you guys have a drink um but 
share a little bit about your passion and where your love for hockey came from. Not necessarily for the Islanders, but just where you fell in love with the game. And I'll get you, uh, grumpy old man, to go first. Yeah, I'm, now I'm a little bit older than most of the other people who are on this podcast right now. I remember watching Bobby Orr play live. Uh, I used to watch MSG Network, where the New York Rangers, this was even before the Islanders even came into existence, uh, I used wow. to watch MSG Network or WR TV in New York, and uh, we would, uh, like I said, it was enjoyable watching great teams, great players. The first year I actually remember watching was the first expansion year, where St. Louis lost to uh, Boston wow. in, uh, in the That's Cup it. Finals, and the way they used to set it up back then, they had all the all the uh, original teams in one division and then all the crappy teams in the West. And, uh, you know, it, and we just took it from there. So I've been watching hockey for a long, long time. Became an Islander fan pretty much there as, uh, uh, since their inception. Um, and that was because my dad, who was a Rangers fan, uh, was fed up with the Rangers and their piss pussycat style of play in hockey. So we started rooting for the Islanders because they showed a little bit of life. They showed guts. And that's the way they've been, honestly, their whole uh, – since they've started, without a doubt. I don't think I have an articulate way, grumpy old man, as of when I started watching I'm hockey. Shocked. I'm shocked. Oh, I'm sure you are. I, I, I don't know. I just started watching hockey you know, dribs and drabs when I was growing up as a kid. And then, uh, you know, my family is from up north, and, uh, you know, they were Islander fans. So I started following, and uh, I guess the first time I really remember cognizantly watching hockey probably was when John Tavares was drafted. Uh, that's trying to kind of, you know, my interest sparked a little more with the Islanders. I mean, geez, we went through a lot of dark time periods. And the funny thing is, as soon as he leaves, then we get we get <laughs> off to this, uh, this uh, greener pasture, per se. Okay. I mean, do you see how boring he is? <laughs> Hello, this is TJ, and I'm going to explain to you my history of how I enjoy it. I don't have I don't have a cool history story. I'm not, uh, sorry, Grump. I'm not over there watching Bobby Orr and Stan, Mc, uh, Stan McKeetis over here, Grumpy Old Man. Sorry I wasn't there, you know, when the inception of the sport was put around, huh? Okay, first of all, it wasn't the ex uh, inception of the sport, all right? I'm being facetious. It's hyperbole. You should know that. Come on. Yeah. Come on, bro. <laughs> Well, it's, it seems like you guys got a lot of insight and a lot of experience put together. So please check out their uh, their podcast and watch, subscribe, whatever it takes, because we've listened, we've enjoyed. We've had a couple of chuckles and giggles, and of course, the drink is always uh, uh, required. But uh, yeah. one of the things that we wanted to ask is, what are your thoughts in terms of not only the offseason with Lou Lamorello, but the first few games that the, the Islanders have played. How, how are things going? Are you happy, not happy? What, what, what's going on? Is the Dano Char a good addition? <laughs> okay, for, first of all, I just want to let you know, our podcast is not a typical team podcast, you know, where it's like, hey, Johnny, everything's great. Our team is fantastic. We're winning a cup every year. I know we're Arizona, but hey, let me tell you something. We got a shot this year. The sun is always shining every single day. That's not what our podcast is about. Now, TJ, I'm going to let you give your take on what you thought the offseason was like and what you think so far, and then I'm going to give you the real take. Go, TJ. Yeah. Okay. Here, here's it is because I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and break it down in a few different parts, and Grump's probably gonna get upset with it. But the offseason consisted and comprised of three different areas: how we did in the draft, how we were able to shed cap and what type of additions we made. In the draft, I think we did a good job. We went ahead and were able to go ahead and indicate guys like Aturatu, uh, Lennox there in net, you know, which are, I thought were really, really value picks for where they were selected. I thought, you know, if we're looking at the draft, that's a high B. Um, shedding cap, I thought we did a fantastic job. Getting rid of Nick Letty, getting some draft capital back in return, getting rid of Andrew Ladd, those two pieces were important in order to move off. Um, regarding, though, additions to the team, I think that left, you know, something to be desired. We did not go ahead and find, you know, a big fish. We had at one point in time, $18 million in cap space. You know, there were rumors at times that maybe we're going to get rid of Islander favorite, Josh Bailey, and maybe Vladdy Tarasenko grumpy Vladimir Tarasenko might be coming back in, you know, the way of the New York Islanders. But, uh, you know, I think trade talks broke down, but, you know, we've always needed a top six, you know, elite sniper 
So uh, it's something that we don't really have. I mean, they want Oliver Walsh to be able to step into that role. He's not ready yet. And this is a team that has a finite window. This is a team that, I mean, their time in front of the sun is fading and fading quickly. So I was all in for them taking every single step and measure necessary in order to go ahead and put us on the pinnacle. I don't think we did that yet this offseason. That being said, we've got glaring holes on our left-handed defense. I mean, you have Andy Green and Zidane Chara starting every yeah. single night, every game for the New York Islanders. That's not good. So we've got holes on the left-handed defense side, and we're missing a top, you know, elite sniper. So there's definitely room for improvement. Uh, okay. As we can see, TJ, very verbose. Uh, so all I'm going to say is my prediction when the offseason started, TJ, what was my prediction what Lou Lamarillo would do? You said absolutely nothing. <laughs> Thank you very much. And as everyone knows, my nickname is Grumpstradamus. And I often say on our podcast, I hate being right all the time. So what did we do? We bring a 4,800-year-old 40, Zidane Achara, a 3,900-year-old Zach Parise, because I think we just wanted to lead the league in age this year. And so far, that's the only thing we're leading the league in. Uh, off to Adding goals against, goals surrendered. No, no, Montreal's given up more goals than we have. So, uh, uh, but let's just say it has been an inauspicious start, shall we say. I feel we will right the ship at some point in time, uh, but I think we're probably a borderline playoff team this year. Uh, I don't, just don't think we have enough talent up front to be true Stanley Cup contenders. Uh, and the thing that gives us problems, as we saw the first two, day, first two games in particular, uh, is speed and aggressive forecheck. And that's kind of our kryptonite. Right. And now Carolina's in our division, and that's bad news for us. It was so, odd, too. We went from a team that was always an underdog, even after we made yeah. the Eastern Conference Final in that you know uh, truncated season to where we went to the bubble. The next year, we were not a favorite to make, you know, any sort of uh, Stanley Cup run. And, you know, after two years and back-to-back -back Eastern Conference Finals, I mean, when you hear Barry Melrose saying, I'm picking the New York Islanders to win the Stanley Cup, I say, holy shit, that's the first time I've ever heard anything like that in my short lifetime. It's, it's a different feeling, and I, ugh, I just, I'm, I'm not sure it's all what it's, I'm not sure we're there. I, I think one of the things that I know from the West, because we're out in the wet in Western Canada and uh, a lot of people are really high. I mean, Pavel, my, uh, my uh, co-host, of course, you know, he knows absolutely nothing about hockey, but he's been like, you know, tooting the horn for the Islanders for the last few years. Uh, and you know what? I, 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 I got to admit, Trotz has done a great job. Lou has done a great job. But one of the things that had me worried was your back end. You know, it look, I mean, you guys got about third in your top six. Um, you have about thirty eight million dollars uh, taken up in salary in that section without that true sniper, you said. But, you know, so you're doing it by committee. But that back end and you guys just brought that up. Yeah, I'm just like, like, how do you deal with the loss that you, you suffered on the back end? Like, where do they go from here? Yeah, uh, go ahead, TJ. I'll let you I'll let you touch on that. Um, I'll let you, how about this? I'll let you take the top six because you're going to get a hit on some of your few favorite players and few all time favorite Islanders Grump. I'll talk about the back six. Um, that being said, I mean, Pelik and Pulak signing those extensions on, on really, I will say cap friendly deals. That was spectacular, right? Yeah. Applause yeah. to Lou Lamarillo. Uh, you know, we give out, you know, uh, I think applause would need be, but we also give out fair and just criticism. So he did a fantastic job. It's the first time. And I want to say years that talented Islanders actually have taken a hometown discount to stay with the team. So that means, awesome. you know, they bought into whatever Lou Lamarillo is selling, you know, the future and the vision there that Barry Trotz is also espousing. That being said, Noah Dobson, I think is ready to take the step up, but man, oh man, Sedano Chara and Andy Green just, I'm sorry. Maybe you can survive with one of them playing bottom pairing minutes, but you cannot survive with both of those individuals playing 16 plus minutes a night. I mean, it, it's just tough. It's tough to be successful as a team like that. I mean, Chara, we love him. Future Hall of Famer, first ballot type of guy. He is limited with what he can do. He's slower. And, uh, you know, he's, we know his limitations. He should not be out there every night, and neither should Andy Green. So what do we do? 
right? Maybe we could promote from within with Sebastian Ajo, but you know, even then, I, I don't really feel like he's the long term answer. And with a short, finite window, we really have to find a guy that's a real top four defenseman as a left handed defenseman. And those those players aren't cheap. Okay, I'll touch on the forward group or lack of uh, forward group. Uh, I often refer to our team as Maddie and the Jags because <laughs> Matt Barzell is the whole team offensively. Everybody else is just a guy. That's how you get the name Jags. I have my personal whipping boys like Croc Nelson, the king of the secondary, <laughs> Josh Bailey, uh, Average Anders Lee. Uh, you know, the list just goes on and on. Lollipop Leo Komarov, the $6 million man, Matt Martin. The reason why we're in trouble with salary cap is because we insist on signing guys in their 30s to long-term deals. So what do we do this offseason? As we do shampoo Lou Lamarillo, wash, rinse, repeat, we sign Kyle Palmieri, who's 30, to a four-year deal. Then we sign Casey Zizekas, a fourth-line center, who's been good in his time, yeah. to a six-year deal. Now, I don't know. For me, I've never seen a fourth-line center get – uh, 10 years in contracts uh, over the, and be overpaid. Now it's taking a little bit less money this time, but six years. It's just that short-sightedness. So what does it do? It means that none of your young players, if we had any of those, ever have a shot of breaking into the, uh, to the starting lineup. And I feel like competition breeds success, and I just don't think that's something we have right now. As you can tell, I'm frustrated with the product. That, that's interesting uh, when you're you're talking about Casey. Um, cause I'm just looking here, and he's he's scored in his career to this date in almost 600 games, about point three. Eh? Yeah, he's gonna yeah, play until he, he's 36. He well, I mean, Uncle up. Leo, Uncle Leo was just uh, put on waivers and cleared, which is good, you know. But Hawkins. then they brought up Matt Martin in the last game versus Chicago, I believe. So, I mean, I'm gonna I'm not gonna lie that that third and fourth line are kind of grumpy and mean so you know similar to your name they can really put up a fight when you need them to but i don't know i find the islanders out in the west like being a very tough team dynamic team there may be no superstars that but they bind to the system that trots does and next to maybe quenville i think trots is probably the best coach right now in the nhl and i like i think he's worth every penny what he's providing and what he's doing but i don't know what are your thoughts in terms of is Barry Trotz able to get him to the promised land? I mean, he struggled in, in uh, Washington. It took him a while, but he did it finally. Do you think they can break through in the next two years? And no. I will add as a caveat, when I watched the last two playoffs, versus, uh, them versus the Tampa Bay Lightning, Tampa Bay had the hardest time versus Islanders than they had versus any other team in the playoffs. That was just how I saw it. But True. I'll agree with you. In answer to your first question, the answer is no. We're not winning okay. the Stanley Cup with Barry Trotz as head coach, unless, and here's my caveat, he changes, uh, he changes the way that he thinks a little bit. And by that, I mean incorporating younger players into the lineup. You can't ride veterans. I'm a big believer in learning, uh, letting the young guys during the season, since they have more upside, give them more rope. So this way, come playoff time, you reap the benefits. And I feel that's not something that he's done. And he's never done it. The only reason he won a cup with Washington, think about it. Now, if you remember, yeah, yeah. they were the fed. They win the president's trophy how many years in a row, row? They win division, could never beat Pittsburgh. The yeah. one year they beat Pittsburgh, who did they play in the finals? Vegas, an expansion team. And you finally got bought buy-in from Ovechkin. But look at the talent they had on that team. That's the only reason they won. I mean, you know, am I going to say that Barry Trotz is a terrible coach? Absolutely not. He has helped bring respectability mm -hmm. back to the Islanders. But at some point in time, if you want to get over the hump, you mentioned Joel Quinville. I often say he's the best coach in the league. Look what he's done in Florida in just two short okay. years. And what does he do? He incorporates younger players into his system. And that's that's my biggest uh, problem with Barry. I often say it's, you know, instead of Benny and the Jets, it's Barry and the Vets. <laughs> I like it. Yes, it is. So, so if you guys, oh, go ahead, go ahead. TJ. Oh, no, I was just about to say, I like to look at us in our playing style as we're the vampires of the NHL. We <laughs> suck the blood and the fun out of other teams, and when they get frustrated and when they think to themselves, and that's why, again, like in the regular season, when you don't see the Islanders all that often, 
it's a tough matchup because oh wow they're gonna play this you know uh, slow style of hockey they're gonna play this uh you know kind of drudge where they're gonna go ahead and they would like wow. to spend a lot more time in their defensive zone they're gonna go ahead and push all shots and opportunities to the periphery we're gonna be a perimeter pete you're not gonna have a lot of high danger scoring opportunities and you're gonna make one mistake on the back end and they're gonna have an odd man break going the other way a two-on-one and they score and they're just happy and content sitting there up one nothing uh, you know it's a style to where it, it's really it it maximizes what we have there, our, our pieces, right? You know, the sum has always been greater than the parts with Barry Trotz. That being said, the biggest need we've always had is a increasing on the offensive side of the puck, right? When we've played Tampa, even last year, right? Seven games played, 11 goals. We just can't score against the ultra-talented teams. And again, Tampa, by, you know, by any, any means necessary, best team in the NHL last year and the year before. You know, Grumpy, I was going to say, Grumpy, this this must be really hard for you. Um, I mean, I'm a little bit older, not maybe your age, man. Um, obviously, I get why you get your grump on. Uh, but you you grew up with the late 70s, the, uh, the, the you know, the I hated the Islanders. I, I came to know the Islanders because of playing the Canucks against King Richard Berdur, man. You know, I remember, Bobby I remember Nystrom. that four sweep. I remember that. <laughs> oh, I do too. <laughs> and, and, but you know, when you're dealing with Mike Bossy and Brian Trotche and Bobby Nystrom and Clark Gillies, I mean, John Tanelli, I mean, they were tough. They were skilled, um, you know, and, and we should make mention today, the announcement uh, or just mentioned here, uh, Mike Bossy, you know, our prayers go out to, um, you know, the Bossy and, and his family. But I mean, yeah, like it, like that's a long time suffering as an islanders guy over all these years and not to mention all the stuff you guys went through at nasa and are you in brooklyn where are you man how well, have you managed we're, we're, we're going to be in belmont in another what month maybe i think we just start off in belmont we're going to finally play a home game uh i just want to touch real quick on what pablo said about tampa bay uh, the islanders being their toughest test and that is true but if you watch those games, did you ever feel that the Islanders were going to win either one of those series? Because I didn't. I mean, I didn't. Last, maybe not in 2019, two years ago, but last year, I mean, they went to game seven and it was a one nothing game. So, I mean, I, the, the question I think also comes down to goaltending. And I mean, I'm not going to say anything about Vasilevsky because I think he's been an MVP for that team. Like, you, you, he's the best goalie right now in the world. Like, you can't compete with what Vasilevsky has done. I mean, right now he's been struggling a little bit. The the back and forth with Detroit recently, I think it was like 7-6. That was kind of a poor man show. But Vasilevsky was the better goaltender out of uh, out of the two. But, I mean, I don't know. Like, do you think your goaltending is quality enough? We didn't we didn't really touch on it. You know, you have Sorokin, uh, or not Sorokin, uh, yes, yeah, Sor uh, Ilya Sorokin. And then you have Schneider, who has struggled in New Jersey, Right. And he hasn't really performed and he's kind of on a one year show me deal. But what are your thoughts there? Yeah. Uh, Snyder is just there until Barlamov comes back. He'll be back probably within the next couple of weeks. He'll be back. Uh, so I'm not worried about that. And But to the honest, this is not really about goaltending. I think our goaltending is good. I view Varlamov as more of a, a just a solid goaltender, but it's the system. Right. It's the trot system. It's a team defense. And that's what you haven't seen so far this year. You haven't seen the full commitment from uh, the forwards coming back, the defense, knowing one another. Uh, and I think that's why we're struggling to begin this season. And you're seeing Sorokin yeah. get hung out to dry quite often. And uh, but I think that Sorokin has an opportunity to be uh, certainly the best goaltender that the Islanders have seen in quite a while. And again, you look at their goalie coaches, you know, uh, Pierre Greco and Mitch Korn, they're fantastic. And you look at the goalies they've had since Barry Trotz has been there. It doesn't matter. It's almost like you can pick and choose. You could slot whatever goalie and net minor you want in there. They're going to be successful. The first season, what was it? It was Robin Leonard and Thomas Grice. Both had big things to prove. Both came out there and lit the world on fire. Then you had uh, Varlamov, right? He was coming off of a, a less than stellar, you know, stint out west, and he comes here to the Islanders. And again, he's already able to turn and you know reinvent himself a little bit. Doesn't matter really who they have in net there. I, I always trust as long as again the defensive system's going and we're playing our style of hockey. Um, as long as our defenses or as long as our goalies have their confidence, they're going to put up really gaudy video game s numbers. Yeah. I mean, so, I, I don't think that, back to your question, Grumpy, like, I don't think 
that uh, they may have won the Stanley Cup, depending on what happened. I mean, Montreal was a miracle run. We'll, we can all admit that. But, like, between Tampa Bay and Islanders, like, I know Tampa Bay was the better team on paper. But, I mean, I could have seen Islanders steamrolling through them. And especially since that's what happened with Vegas, right? Vegas should have beaten Montreal. And they came across a hot goalie and a streaky team that was able to score left, right, and center, right? They're young forwards, like you say, the young guys were able to score the Nick Suzuki's and whatnot. So, and Cole Caulfield's, right, coming out. But I just, so. I like to do this quick scenario when I think last year, the series was tied two to two. And I think that Stamkos and Kucherov and Vasilevsky woke up one morning and they're like, oh, wait, we're going back to Tampa. We're in Tampa, we're at home what i just i just put on my laptop the series is tied two to two hey vasileski do you realize that the islanders are tied two to two with us yeah call up kucherov hey nikita do you see it's two two they're like yeah so what happens next game they blow us out eight nothing and tj correctly predicted that there was no way the islanders were losing the potentially the last home game at nassau coliseum and he was right and even though it was only one nothing uh in game seven i to me tampa bay just totally controlled the play i just felt they were kind of toying with us most of the time his thing Tampa Bay was the best team in the league last year by far. There's no harm in losing to Tampa Bay. They were just better than everybody else the last two years. So there's no crime in that. But I just don't think the Islanders have enough to beat the high-end teams, if you will. I mean, I think the Atlantic, whatever, the Metro Division, uh, just a couple of quick things. The Metro Division isn't as strong as it used to be. Last year, last year we had a good run. Tristan Jari, if he even pretended or if Mike Sullivan didn't want to play with an empty net the whole series, they would have beaten us because, honestly, they outplayed us. Then you go, you play against Boston, and Tuka Rask has a torn hip, torn hip labrum. You know, those are advantages. As soon as Carlo goes out, that's it. Their defense is shot. Two years ago, and people forget, we qualified fourth for the playoff last year in a 56-game season. The year before – with the pandemic, we weren't even going to make the playoffs. We had just got off of a seven game losing streak. We had like one win out of our last 11, losing to teams like Detroit, losing to teams like Ottawa. We were miserable. We would not have made the playoffs. That's correct. If it were not, you know, the opportunity with the, with the bubble. And that's the issue for me anyway, with the Barry Trotz style and system of play is it's, you got to grind out every single game and that wears the body down. As in, and as probably the second or oldest team in the league right now, let's see how they work over the course of an 82 game season when you have 19 back to backs, 11, three, and fours. I just don't know how we're going to hold up. Well, not to mention, you guys got 13. This is a record <laughs> 13 road games. I, I get the arena situation. Um, that, that was my concern coming in. I don't care how good the Islanders were going to be coming in. That was my concern. Does that get you guys a little bit concerned having a 13 road games to start the season? Not for me. It does not I'm always, and now 13 is a lot, but I feel the teams gel when they're on the road, as opposed to yeah. being at home. 13 is an awful lot of games, but there's a lot of, there's not a whole lot of back to backs in the, that first 13, which is good one on one off. So we're not, we shouldn't get burned out. My concern is, are we going to have the same type of energy that we got at Nassau Coliseum in the new building? That's and yet to be seen. Arena. Well, here's the thing too. Maybe if we were a younger team, I can understand kind of some of the highs and, and lows of being on the road, right? You know, this should be, this should play right into our hand. When you're talking about a veteran laden team, what 11 guys over the age of 30 years old. Yeah. These are all guys that have been there, done that. They know how to win on the road. They should feel very comfortable with road games. I'm not expecting any time, or I should, at least going into the season, I was not expecting any sort of issues or hindrances of starting off with a long road trip. Okay, so let, let me lead you guys in a direction. How are the Islanders going to continue to grow? That's the question right now. How are they going to get better? Uh, for me, they said they're all in. All in for a Stanley Cup. It's Stanley Cup or bust this year. Well, we have nobody in the minors getting ready to come up, particularly in the forward group. 
And I think that's Barry Trotz's fault. And you say, well, how come? Lou's the guy who picks the players. I think Lou Rook works really closely with whoever the coach is. Because remember, when he was with Toronto, no problem playing the younger players. Yeah. If Barry says this is what he needs to win, I think Lou does whatever he can to give him what he feels that he needs to win. And that's why I think makes him such a great general manager, honestly. Now, on our podcast, I am always ripping Lou Lamarillo, always. <laughs> but, you know, on your show, I'm going to, I, you know, hey, just part, part of what I do. But, uh, you know, he's an all-time general manager, right? Should he have won GM of the year two years in a row? No, absolutely not. And uh, just looking at the moves he made this year, I think they should take at least one of those away. Well, he, I, I, I'm going to agree with you really quickly just on Lou Lamarillo. I don't, I don't confer with my, uh, my wonderful co-host here because I do not think Lou Lamarillo left much to be desired in Toronto. I think, anyway. I think he has a system and maybe it, maybe it's a, it's a aerial view of what he does. Maybe you guys know better and more inside knowledge about it, but the, the, this culture where even like you have to shave the whole year until the playoffs, like this culture that he brings into the locker room, people buy in. And for whatever reason, it's a team dynamic. You know, you look at any teams like the Toronto Maple Leafs, the Oilers, uh, some of the bigger ones that have like superstars on them. You know, even Minnesota now, you know, where they were a team team and now you have Caprice off on that team. It's that his team, you know, it's that superstar is going to lead that team. But when it comes to the Islanders, yeah, you have Barzell, you have these elite players, but they're not like superstars, but they buy into the team dynamic. And so Lou gets them to buy in and he makes them work hard and he gets the grind out. And you got players, I think Elliot Freeman said this once best, you got players who get you to the playoffs, and then you got the guys who get you to the promised land, which is the Stanley Cup. And I think you have both. And that's what is great about the Islanders is that you compete. You just need to get in to the playoffs, and then what happens in the playoffs is anyone's game. So that's how I see it as. See, I'm, the only thing I'm going to differ when you say, I don't think we have any, I think we have one difference maker on the whole team, and that's Matt Barnes. Okay. He's not. Okay. Yeah. And that, you looked at the Tampa series. Who's the only player who really showed up when really yeah, stepped up? No, hundred percent. Ability to was Barzell. I'm just thinking, like, if he was on any other team, if they weren't playing that defensive game, he would have at least hundred points minimum. He would be in my he, mind. He would be a superstar in this league, playing for another team. Yeah. And that's you know that's what I often said to, said to TJ. I'm like, you know, how do you get better? We've never signed a free agent from another team who's amounted to anything, or you know, a big name guy. We've made some offers, but no one comes. Why? You have to subjugate your game to play in the Islander system under Barry Trotz. So if you're like a, 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 a Panarin or to a less extent Tavares uh, or whoever, are you going to say, gosh, you know, I'm used to scoring 75, 80 points a year. If I go there, I'm going to spend, I'm going to score 40. Is that something I want to do? And I think that's really something that people should question. Don't get me started on John Tavares. I'm sure. I'm sure our <laughs> friends here have never heard oh, of John Tavares. So. I, I see you wiggling in your chair. You're still butt hurt over that, aren't you? Ah, there it is. There it is. No, I, I don't. I don't disagree either, Grump. I mean, here's the thing, though, too. Right? We've heard every excuse under the sun regarding why the Islanders could never attract big name free agents, why they could never take the next step. Oh, the arena that was, you know, was an issue. Our practice facilities. Oh, people don't like that. We have to split time between Barclays and Nassau Coliseum and they're going down the list. Oh, this is the reason that's the reason. Well, right. You got the brand spanking new arena. You've got the brand spanking new practice facility. You have ownership that has helped elevate this team to a legitimate contender there is no longer ever should be any excuse as to why the Islanders are unable to attract big name free agents if it falls and if the cards are suited for them. And just to touch, since you did ask me a question, Pavel, and I skirted around it, I'm really no. good at that, spitting my own narrative <laughs> and something, something. The things that uh, could actually make us in the future uh, good again, I mean, we are good now, but I think we're getting ready for a fall. I mean, with a, with a really aged roster of veterans who are long-term deals that's everyone knows that's death in the nhl particularly the way the game is played now right based on it's all predicated on speed puck movement and we're kind of a dinosaur when it comes in that regard but what's the positives going forward we have an ownership group that is absolutely willing to spend 
to keep this team viable and make the team better. Lou Lamarillo, even at his age, I don't want anything to happen to Lou because I um, feel that they might move Fredo Lamarillo up from Bridgeport uh, up to the Islander job, which I don't want to see. Uh, and Barry Trotz is an excellent coach, uh, but we need to get some younger talent on this team. That's to me, that's the key. They didn't catch your Fredo Lamarillo joke, Grumpy. They caught it. It was a little late. It was a little late, but they got it. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna make a bold prediction or ask you a bold prediction. Would the Islanders be a sneaky surprise or a dark horse for Jack Eichel since they're going no. for it? No. no, no, yeah, no, absolutely not. I look at it. A, we don't have enough to offer them, honestly. Yeah, I look at I look at our and again, like when we say we have no depth at all in the A, the most highly touted uh, Islanders prospect that's, I guess, maybe the closest to making an NHL debut. You're looking at the defensive side of the puck, Robin Sallow, left-handed defenseman, and then maybe Samuel Bolduc, left-handed defenseman. But again, I, I don't envision them moving those two individuals. Ideally, what I thought the Islanders wanted to have happen is they came in with the idea of we'll start the season with Chara and Andy Green, both on one-year contracts, and at the trade deadline, we're going to acquire a left-handed defenseman because those two guys cannot actually foot the bill in the playoffs. So you're able to give them more rests, and you're able to bring in a top-four left-handed defenseman. At the end of the season, you're going to go ahead and move and integrate in Robin Sallow and Samuel Bolduc as they get older and as they're ready to take the next step. That being said, we're noticing immediately that uh, we might need to be a little more proactive with that than not. And again, Simon Holmstrom, Simon Casper Holmstrom, grumpy old man, instead of the three amigos, I will tell you, we have said this. This was now three years ago. I believe it was the 2019 draft, right, Grump? I was ready. I had my guy, Phil Tomasino, Connor McMichael, Arthur Kaliev. I had them. I'm like, man, we got our pick old three. They picked Casper Holmstrom. If you want to know why he's called Casper, look at his picture. That's all I'm going to say. So, and now he's been three three games in Bridgeport this year. He's putting up Josh Bailey like numbers: no goals, no assists, minus two. He's right there. With I, I, I was going to say, you know, uh, so the Bridgeport Islanders, the AHL team, they brought in uh, Paul Thompson, who was with the Wolfpack. You know, he's only 32 years old, and uh, he fits the bill to be called up. You know, he's scoring .6. He fits, he fits the mold for what they look for. I mean, well, you always want somebody who he can play pinochle with. That's, that's how he makes his signs. So does, young guys, does, young guys need not apply. So then does Noah Dobson need to take that next step now because of he's, yes. he's coming up in his, I think third year, if I recall, third or fourth, he's yeah. coming up on a contract year. If I because he was the same year as Evan Bouchard and yes. as well as Atu Rati, who really impressed. And I thought, other teams really passed on it, and he really impressed in the preseason. What, what are your thoughts on those two guys? Uh, Noah Dotson, he's already stuck up his game. He's third in minutes now. He's kind of taken over the Nicoletti role um, as a puck-moving defenseman. Matter of fact, if you look at it, he's the only puck-moving de moving defenseman that they really have. Pelik and Pulak don't really classify as that. Char and Green, thank you, and Scott Mayfield. So there you go. Um, and that's why we do need that. I mean, that's the way the NHL is going, right? Puck moving defensemen don't need to have the guys who are six foot five, 265 pounds who knock people down in front of the crease. I love that style of hockey, honestly. I absolutely love the cross checking. I love all that, that dirty stuff that went around in front of the net, but that's passe. Okay. I realize it's gone. Uh, so you're seeing Dobson already step up in his minutes, which we expect to see that increase. Uh, what was part two of your question? I Atu Rati, uh, this yes. year's draft, when he got picked yeah. up and he impressed in the preseason, I think. Yes. Yeah. He had uh, a good showing. Yeah. Uh, there was he's no way. He to, he's been off. He's been off to, again, he's at Carpot Grumpy, uh, as we talked about beforehand on other podcasts. Again, he, it's always seemed to be an issue of when he steps up to the, uh, you know, the, the actual elite or the Finnish elite league. It doesn't really put up points and he struggles a little bit. He did well in under 20s, uh, no problem at all. And again, even this summer, 
he had a fantastic, fantastic summer showcase, and he played well. I thought he showed flashes uh, in preseason. That being said, it's it's deceiving to see what he does at Carpot because I mean it's just it's everything's out there on the periphery. They don't let him drive the net too often. And again, I'm not sure if their system or what it is, yeah. but he had, first time drafted, he he had no chance. I'm sure as Grumpy was going to say to make the team, but that's a guy maybe. I mean, what, Grump, you're thinking probably three years, maybe removed from his draft class, maybe when he's turning 21, 22 years old, he might be looking at a chance and an opportunity to make it into the NHL. Right. Here's the thing. There are no spots open on this team. Unless you move some players, you look at Lee has five more years on his deal. You know, everybody has three, four years left on their deal. So there, and here's the thing, Barry just doesn't believe in playing young players. So it's going to be at least two, three years before we see him. I don't care how well he plays. He's they're not going to find a spot for him in the lineup. The thing I, I don't please, look at, bring up Devon Taves, girl. The, oh, I don't want to bring up Devon Taves, please. But see, talk about, talk about a classic mismanagement of yeah. your cap situation. Devon Taves, 25 year old left-handed defenseman. They decided they wanted to keep Nick Letty. Why? Go further back, Grump. Further back, the whole story. Devon. Oh, okay, okay. The whole. Okay. These are okay. brand new listeners okay. to us, Grump. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm going to put the record all the way back. 2018, Barry and Lou's first year there. In the preseason, Devon Taves was our best defenseman. He was wasn't recovering even- from a, he was recovering from a shoulder surgery the year before. He was a consistent AHL All Star defenseman. As you can yeah. tell, we just let TJ just interrupt anytime I'm talking. Right? Oh. <laughs> so here we so uh, and he and he did come off an injury, but he was fantastic in the preseason, obviously healthy. But what does Barry do? He goes, Well, you know, we know we had a shoulder injury last year, so we're gonna send him down to the minors. And they keep Thomas Hickey up. Adam Pellick, who now everyone acknowledges is a fantastic young de- defensive defenseman. He didn't even start the year as a starter. It was Lucas Spiza, who they signed on a PTO. Because Barry loves his veterans, Barry and the vets. After a while, it was pretty obvious that Lucas Spiza didn't have any more. Pellet became a starter. And it wasn't until Thomas Hickey got injured right in December that Devon Taves came in. All of a sudden, he comes in. The Islanders take off. Why? Now look at your defense pairings. He's our winning perfect. percentage, our winning percentage with Thomas Hickey was about five hundred across the board. With Devon Taves, we had about ten or ten or twelve more wins as wow. compared to losses. And uh, Mayfield and Taves were a really good. They really worked well together. That I felt was an issue with the Islanders last year after they lost Taves because of the mismanagement. Letty and Mayfield never really meshed. And like I said, when you say, well, we couldn't afford Devon Taves. Well, you had Nick Letty for $5 million. Taves signs a four-year deal at a way younger age for $4.1 million per year. So it's because, why? Because Barry loved Nick Letty, and he didn't want to let him go. And Lou, as a general manager, should have said, I know you like that, but you know what? For the future of the team, we're going to move yeah. Nick Letty at 29 years old, and we're going to keep the guy who's 24 who makes less salary. They chose not to do that. You kind of make your bed. You have to lie in it. Wow. Well, guys, we're going to have to get wrapped up here. As we say, we always go late and a little bit later on our shows all the time. But before we do, I just wanted to throw one thing out there. Non-Islander, this is NHL related. I know you guys got to get going because Grumpy's already took off on vacation like the Islanders have for the season. (laughs) <laughs> you got it. You picked so, up on it. So, so preseason, they 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 said we're we're gonna you know we're gonna get tough on cross checking. Now I know you like that, Grumpy, but they said we're gonna get tough. And is this gonna continue throughout the season, or is this all gonna lessen as the season goes on? And then come playoffs, so you got the same old thing where you do what you want. And really, the truth is, is playoffs, the power play and penalty kill do not count as much. What's your guys' final take? DJ, any take on that before I espouse on it? Yes, I think that you're going to see that kind of start to wean down. And in the playoffs, don't be confused. It's playoff-style hockey. Slash Paul Bunyan slashes on sticks. Two-handed cross checks to the back of the head. As long as nobody's dead out there on the ice, they're going to let it go. Okay. Okay. My slant on it, 
as we've seen year after year, whatever starts off the beginning of the season is a point of emphasis. As the season goes on, the players learn to a certain extent. Uh, I've seen some cross checks that have been called so far. I'm like, come on, that's really borderline. I think you're going to see the big two-handers get called, but I think the little love taps are not going to get called come playoff time. That's fair. That's fair. Well, Pavel, why don't you give us your last take here? I know you've shared it before, but share it again. Is it going to last? No, it's not going to last. I think it's garbage. Honestly, it's just going to come back. Like, it's silly that they even have this rule in place or that they're force enforcing this rule. Because I've seen a few games already with different teams, and I, I don't even know what a cross-check is anymore. Like, just like any other rule in the NHL. <laughs> it's where you take your hands on the sticks oh, like Oh, I know. I know. And, like, oh, you said you didn't know what it was. You said you did not know what it was. Because I because when I've seen it done to other players, it's three or four, and then the ref's like, well, you did it three or four times, and I couldn't let you do it another time. And I'm like, well, then why did you let it go the first time? Maybe it's the width of holding the stick. <laughs> like I Maybe said, it's when the player's against the boards and they get a cross check and they go into the boards. That's when it's seen. Because I see it a lot in front of the net and it doesn't get often called, right? And is it upper body or lower body, right? Is it the hip or is it the upper back? Like, I, okay. I, don't know. I have a quick question for you guys before we go. Remember when hitting the guy from behind used to be a penalty? Everybody gets hit from behind. I don't think anyone doesn't get every single hit is from behind. Everyone. Yeah. You're told you're told to look behind you when you're going into your own defensive zone to protect the puck or get rid of it as a defenseman or as a winger. And you're supposed to know and look behind. But oftentimes the game is so fast that the players don't see it. And so you easily go into the boards. But sometimes in terms of positioning, it's awkward. And so you had the Dylan Larkin versus the Matthew Joseph hit, which was questionable, which should have been a penalty. But then Lark Larkin sucker punched them right afterwards, right? But it's hard, right? It's such a fast game. But Evan, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, and it's interesting, actually, uh, TJ and Grumpy. Uh, we actually had, uh, I forget his last name, and I apologize if you're following us here today, Chris. Uh, he was a WHL lineman for many years uh, in the, CH, uh, the CHL. And he actually said his belief is that the moment in minor hockey they started putting the stop sign on the back of players uh, and not making people responsible because you, you guys remember seeing the old games where you actually got to be prepared for the hit. Yep. And now you turn, you take a penalty, you, you lose a few teeth. You don't lose teeth because you're getting hit with the puck in the face. You lose teeth because you're going in the boards. That's right. That's, That's crazy. Right. That's right. Well, guys, thanks so much, man. We appreciate you being here today. Uh, once again, uh, go ahead, plug your podcast. Let us know where we can find you. You can find our Islanders podcast at the Islanders Never Say Die podcast on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Again, that is live every single Wednesday and Saturday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can also find us at TJ and the Grumpy Old Man. That is a sports podcast where we have fun, talk sports, and shoot the shit. That is every Thursday, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and every Sunday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Ish. Yeah. 8 p.m. Ish. 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 That's right. And I just want to say, like I say at the end of every one of our podcasts, love and laughter to everyone who listens and even those who don't from TJ and the Grumpy Old Man. Hey, guys, thanks. Well, in the meantime and in between time. There's six on the ice. Take care, guys. Thank you.